Every day, you and I and all believers have an opportunity to show the world a different way of thinking and talking and living our lives. God has established his church to be a billboard of what it means to be loved by God and what it means to live in relationship with him. Hi, Pastor Stace, once again with you, uh, working through this Bible study series on family, government, and church. We're soon to wrap this up. We're looking at God's institution, the church, and how he intends it to be a blessing to the temporal lives of, of his family, as well as um, the, the, the agent that shares the good news that changes lives forever. To think that as we proclaim the good news of what Jesus has done for sinners, that lives are changed forever. I mean, what other enterprise can boast of such um, eternal significance? None. And so what a gift the church is. But for us to be um, the church, we need God's love, and we also need to be instructed by his word. So before we dive back into uh, the blueprint of a uh, Christian education program or the characteristics of a of a of a healthy church, let's talk with God for a few moments. Please join your heart with mine. Thank you, Lord, for making us a part of your family where you would like your family to grow. And certainly uh, through your efforts, your family does as we share the message of Jesus, as Jesus draws men and women, boys and girls into your family. Bless your church as we seek to make a difference and revive your church that it may lift high the cross and without fear or shame or hesitancy, tell the good news of what you've done for us and for our salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Titus chapter 2, and uh, we're picking up with the last verse uh, that was in our previous part 6. Today it's part 7, and hopefully you've been able to download the, the notes that you can follow along and and, and write down some comments or thoughts of your own and, and just to, to work through this with me. Picking up in, in Titus chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse 5. So, so Paul is, is talking about the characteristics of a healthy congregation or what a good, uh, solid church looks like. And it's, it's about the way all the older men and all the older women um, show forth uh, examples of godliness for the younger men and the younger women to, to uh, see and to heed and to learn about. And uh, it's interesting, right after he talks about what the older women are to do with the younger women, we, we hear this comment in verse 5, at the, toward the end of verse 5 in chapter 2 of Titus, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So uh, all this Christian education instruction, all of this life coaching that is to be carried out in the local congregation is intended so that those who are baptized, those who are numbered among God's, God's family, uh, don't make the word of God look bad so that it's blasphemed, so that we blaspheme God's word or, in a sense, move others who don't believe to think what's the use in, in, in living that way or thinking that way or, or talking that way. They're hypocrites. They're, they're, they're just putting on a show. And so this, this robust Christian education program that is anything but a program, but actually a way of life is, is intended to help us realize that we are billboards. We are living advertisements every day of what it means to be in relationship with God and to be in relationship with the world around us and that we bring to that relationship with the world around us uh, godly thoughts, words, and actions. So picking up in chapter 2, verse 6 to read on, we, we hear this, Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. So you know, he's shifting back uh, to what Titus needs to be instructing others. Uh, younger men are, are to be encouraged. The, the word exhort means to walk alongside and to talk with and to encourage. 
uh, to be self-controlled or or able to to uh, master their um, their 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 ways that they look at things and think about things and and conduct their life. And so Titus is to be teaching the younger men the younger men how to do that. Um, and and it's in in a sense it's explained in 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 um, in in the the following passages, um, verse seven: In all things, show yourself to be a pattern of good works. Uh, and it's interesting; it's like we we start realizing that uh, Titus was a younger man. Um, he's uh, he's he, he's to to be a pattern of good works, verse 7, in doctrine, uh, showing integrity and reverence and incorruptibility. This is uh, chapter uh, 7, uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 7 in the New King James Version. So, so Titus is an example, a pattern of good works, an example of, of what it means to live in the various uh, activities of one's life every day. I mean, think of all the good works you had to work on today and carry out. And, and how did you do those things? Did you grumble and cuss and, and, and fume, or did you uh, embrace them as honestly and as lovingly as you could? And, and that becomes an example for others to see and to bear witness to and learn from. And so this Christian education program in Titus chapter two is very organic. It's very hands-on. It's real time, uh, one step at a time, uh, kind of stuff. This idea of of the the example that Titus is to give to the younger man includes how one speaks about God, how one shares the doctrine of what it means to be saved by grace through faith in Christ apart from works of the law. And what it means to be in relationship with God, in relationship with those around us, and and you know, uh, Titus is to teach uh, with good motives and honestly. He's not to be doing things just for himself or for his own means or or gain. He is to show what it means to be a Christian, uh, serving Christ in and across the people that uh, one encounters. Um, you know, he used to do it with, with dignity, uh, remembering who one is in Christ. You know, I'm a Christian. This is the way I need to be. I can't be that. I can't do that. And, and so forth. And then the, the, the word incorruptibility in the, in the Greek, it, it's, it's that which doesn't lead to death, you know, that, that, uh, but, but rather, teach things and help people understand things and show people how to work through things toward life and, and living. And so it's a high calling for sure, but this is what Titus is supposed to be doing so others can see and learn and, and follow as an example. Uh, reading on in, in verse 8, um, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you all. So again, healthy speech uh, that, that brings life, that, that isn't just mean-spirited or destructive, um, that cannot be condemned. Uh, boy, how, how can someone aim for that? Well, it's better than aiming for sarcasm or, or acrimonious ways of talking. Um, uh, and, and it is to be done so that an opponent uh, may may realize the error of his ways, be ashamed, uh, having nothing evil to say about you all. Um, so the point of what Titus does is so that the whole church um, that, that he is serving or that he's training pastors to serve, the churches they serve, may, may actually have a good reputation, a different kind of reputation um, um, than than perhaps those churches that, uh, that, that aren't doing the same thing or those groups or those religions that, that aren't doing those kinds of things. Um, you know, it's interesting. He's, he's just working through uh, the, the patriarchs and matriarchs and, and then the, the younger men and women and then, 
it's it's like his own version of what Luther has in his small catechism, the table of duties. And and so uh, reading on, we, we're not surprised to find Paul talking about um, another category of people. Uh, verse 9, exhort bondservants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity. I'm reading into verse 10 that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Uh, so encourage, you know, come alongside and talk with those who are slaves, who, who, are, um, who, who have to work for masters or despots, dictators, uh, those who are commanding over them, uh, to be well-pleasing in all things and, and not just talking back, not stealing things, but but showing you know good faith in in all that they do showing in, in their in their life in their work in their talking in their thinking what it means to live as a christian slave or bond servant and um and and the result again that they these bond servants may adorn or decorate themselves with with the teachings of god our savior in all things. So, in all things. Too often we think of good works as things we do every once in a while or, or being a Christian when we show up on Sunday, but our whole life is to be a testimony of what it means to be saved by grace through faith in Christ apart from works of the law. Not, that, again, that this is easy. This is a high calling. And yet this is what God would have us, uh, have us do. Um, you know, this, this Christian education program in Titus chapter 2 is, is about learning a different way of life, a, a way that shows the unbelieving world um, uh, one of, of love and hope and, and joy and a willingness to sacrifice self in service to others and, and, and what it means to live trusting in God's love and celebrating His grace. And, and that's what the, the Lord would have us have us spend our time doing. And, and you know, and yet, boy, we think about this. We wonder about how we've measured up to these things. And anytime a Christian looks at these kinds of high ideals, it, it can move one to say, Lord, I haven't done so well. And, and that's called repentance. And that's not a bad thing. It means that we're confessing our need for his love and forgiveness. And boy, that's why he sent his son Jesus to save us from our sins. As we look at these qualities of a, of a godly man, a godly woman, a godly son, a godly daughter, um, uh, we, we realize how, how much we fall short and, and how as, as we recognize that we are sinners, we, we rejoice in the one who laid down his life for us. In fact, Jesus would have us repent and rethink and realize, man, I fall short. But then to trust in his grace, in what he has done to save us. And in the power of his love and forgiveness, we can look at these things and say, okay, this is what I'd like to focus on. This is what I would like to do uh, because I've been saved by God's grace. And, you know, knowing that when we fail again, we have someone who's got our back, who has us covered, has us forgiven because of what he did, that once for all sacrifice that has changed the course of your life and my life and made us, made us uh, children of God and heirs of, of heaven and all that God intends for that, uh, intends in that for us to, to receive when we die. So uh, to, to move on, you know, Paul underlines all this. Uh, why are these important things to teach? Uh, because in verse 11, we, we read it this way. I really like the way the old NIV renders the Greek in this. Uh, but I'll read the New King James Version. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So the grace of God is teaching us. Um, God has appeared. He is, he's epiphanied. 
and and um, this salvation has has shown up and it's come to all men you know god would have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of salvation that's first timothy and um and it's that grace that's teaching us to say no to ungodliness and yes to godliness and so we're realizing as we learn and grow in, in, in God's grace and as we hear his scriptures and, and understand his will for us, we're learning that taking those vacations in our sinful nature um, is, is, is no substitute for living in relationship with the Lord, understanding that the grace of God is teaching us to, to say no to our sinful desires and, and to say no to what we are offered by the world around us and and actually learning to live self-control this this word self-control or self-disciplined or or god or or sober you know it all has to do with learning how to um to 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 govern our 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 hearts and minds understanding that as new creations in Christ, we need to put to death uh, those things that come from our heart that can uh, pollute our, our, our thinking and our speaking and our conduct. And so, thank God we have grace as our teacher. You know, the law just shows our poor performance. The, the law makes us want to excuse or justify or defend uh, our failures. Uh, the law does not save us. But the grace of God in Christ, what Christ has done for us, that's what, that's what saves us, uh, brings us salvation, and teaches us what it means to live as, as God's billboards in, in the communities where we live. Um, you know, just to, just to read on, not only are we to, to, to learn how to live by God's grace in this present age, but in this present time, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord would have us keep watch to have a watch party for his return, understanding that when the Lord comes back, we, we know that he will usher in the, the, the forever blessings of God. And, and we can have that hope. We can look forward to that because we know that our judgment has already been taken care of by Jesus who died on the cross in our place. So that now we know that God loves us for the sake of his son. And that love empowers us to, to be about all kinds of uh, good works and to also watch uh, for his return. Um, Matthew 25, and there's a lot of interesting things that Jesus says in that chapter, encouraging us to be on the watch for his return. When I was a kid and my dad would say, when I get home from work, we're going fishing. Man, I was a, I had a watch party of myself and, and on my own and had all the fishing stuff on the yard, in, in the front yard, laying out, looking at it, thinking about what I would use and couldn't wait for him to return. Listen, there's so much more coming when our savior comes back to judge the living and the dead. And, and it's important for us to, to understand that he can come at any time, as he says. But, but even more, it's important for us to understand that there are people who can't even wrap their brain around Judgment Day, let alone look forward to it. They see it as something to be avoided. And, and we, as God's family, can actually show them that it need not be a fearful day. It is actually a day that we can look forward to looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we can look forward to his return, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem or purchase us back from every lawless deed so that no lawless deed has any power over us. You and I are forgiven. You and I um, uh, are free in Christ. And our past can't own us. Um, Christ has redeemed us. Not only that, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So we're, we're his special people, um, the Lord's own, who are eager and, and wanting to do all kinds of, 
of good things. And the grace of God is that which is teaching us to do all these things, to, to, to be sober and to, to live out in godly ways, to speak healthy things, and, and to also look forward to the Lord's return. And in that way of life, for you and for me, we, we give the world around us a different alternative lifestyle of, of, of what it means to live um, in God's grace and to live in the strength and power of it. Um, and then, you know, Paul spin, finishes up. He says, um, speak these things. Uh, exhort, you know, or encourage and and rebuke. There are times when, when, when what what Titus had to do, what the pastors on the island of Crete had to do, what what has to be done uh, these days by 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 pastors uh, overseeing a congregation is to is to expose and and convict and 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 reprove certain certain things that are not godly. That, that need to be corrected by applying forgiveness to them. But, you know, this is where we apply the law that reveals the problem, and then we share the gospel that forgives. And, and then finally Paul says, let no one despise you or look down upon you or treat you with contempt. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, Paul wants Titus to understand that the office that he has been brought into as, as an overseer, as a shepherd, is, is a holy thing that, that has to do with God's will for a congregation. You know, this is really an interesting uh, segue to our next Bible passage. And, and it really has to do with Paul. And, and it's fascinating. You know, Paul persecuted the church. When he saw the billboards, he tore them down. He wanted them put to death. And then Jesus stopped them, stopped him short, blinded him with the light, and his life was radically changed. And, you know, maybe your conversion isn't so uh, epic, and yet keep in mind, your, your conversion uh, in, into the Christian faith, being converted uh, by God's grace, is no less important to God and of no less value. But it's interesting how Paul, every once in a while, as he goes through his missionary journeys, talks about uh, that encounter. And, and in, one, in, in one place with King Agrippa, Paul uh, talks about what happened uh, that day so long ago when Jesus arrived on the scenes. And it's in Acts chapter 26. And the, the point I wanted to make from it is, 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 is simply this. As, as Paul shares with, with King Agrippa, um, you know, he talks about what Jesus says, you know, why are you persecuting me? And, um, and, then, and then Jesus says in verse 17, I will deliver you um, from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. And this is the key thing, to open their eyes. So as Paul shares the gospel, as Paul tells what Jesus did dying on the cross and how he's fulfilled all that God promised in the Old Testament, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. Turn on the lights. I mean, Paul knows what it was like, knew what it was like to be in the dark, as religious as he was, as pious as he was, as much as a Pharisee as he was. He knew what it was like to be in the dark and how different his life became when he was brought into the light and his eyes were opened to, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So, you know, those who do not know of Jesus' love and forgiveness, they don't know what Christ did for them. They are being held captive by the devil. And as we share the gospel message, people are being delivered from darkness and the power of the devil uh, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is such a powerful passage. Too often in my own life, I forget the, the, the tragic condition that people who are uh, not believing in Jesus are in and, and how scary and frightening that is for them. And, and, you know, what, Stace, don't you care? 
You know, there have been times in my life when I've prayed for many years for some of my friends who, who I now give thanks for because they know the gospel. Um, it's important for all Christians to have some kind of a connection, praying for someone who's in need of God's grace and perhaps for Christians to even share the gospel with them. So who are you praying for that does not yet know who Jesus is? Uh, may we be people that pray for the salvation of those who remain right now in the dark and held hostage by the devil. That's really what the church is all about. And certainly in our daily life, we bear testimony to what Jesus can do. But, but there are people that don't know. And, and God has established his church to bear testimony to it. You know, what is the church all about? You know, what is the church to be thought of? Uh, we live in a culture right now where there's a lot of people that are struggling with their identities in all kinds of different ways, struggling with their identities and their marriages and their parenting and their work and their relationships with people around them. There are people struggling with their gender identity and with their sexual identity. And, and um, it's important to understand who we are in Christ and for the church to understand what it's about. What is the church's purpose? And I mean, there's, there's just all kinds of Bible passages that can be looked at. But I would like to, to wrap up our time uh, today with, um, um, with Ephesians chapter 3. Um, I mean, it's just interesting what Paul does here. And I'll read it to you. This is Ephesians chapter 8, um, where, where we hear this. Um, you know, he's talking about what Christ has done, and it's in the gospel, verse 13 of chapter 1, that people are, 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 are trusting in the, in, in the Lord after they hear the gospel. And then, you know, we hear this epic um, new life uh, that we who were once dead in trespasses and sins were made alive by God's grace, chapter 2. And then, then he starts explaining about what the purpose of the church is. And I'll pick up with verse 8. To me, who am less than least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus. <clears throat> So it's revealed in Christ. Verse 10, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose uh, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's through the church the manifold wisdom of God is revealed. The manifold wisdom of God. You know, God's ways aren't our ways. His thoughts, not our thoughts. But through the church, God wants to reveal his manifold wisdom. Now, that's what the church does. I'm not sure exactly how all that works. But as we live out our identities as God's own, as we trust in Christ's love and forgiveness and in the strength of that grace, learn how to say no to ungodliness and yes to good works. Uh, we are revealing all kinds of different things. Uh, even if we're not always clear about how it's working, God knows what he's doing in us and through us. Paul goes on. Um, gosh, well, let me pick up with verse 10 again to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's accomplished it in Jesus, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. See, the church was struggling over Paul's imprisonment, but Paul's telling them, don't worry about it. You know, God's manifold wisdom is being made known through through me. God's manifold wisdom is being made, made known through you. And it's because of what Christ has accomplished that gives us a boldness 
and and a and a courage and a conviction um, um, through faith in Him. And so, you know, don't feel bad for me. Uh, don't lose heart, Paul says. You know, it's fascinating. We are to display the manifold wisdom of God in the heavenly places. This is a technical term that Paul uses in Ephesians, and I, I haven't found it in other places. I mean, there, there can be some interesting terms in various uh, various books of the Bible, and, and in the heavenly places is, is one of them for the church in Ephesus. And... Um, I'm sure there's a lot of speculation on why that's the case, but the the truth of it is um, that um, that just to kind of do a survey of the Bible passages where it's found in Ephesians, and I also have these in the notes. But it's interesting. Paul talks about how we have been blessed with every gift in the heavenly places, and and that that Christ was raised to the heavenly places, and we are seated with Him, and and that. Um, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. You know, we can be tempted to think that the Christian church in America has been marginalized, and that is not the case. The Christian church in America is the front line of the battle between uh, the devil and darkness and light and God's forgiving grace. And, and it's, so it's no wonder that we see challenges within the church these days, and, and, and yet uh, Paul wants us to have this this confidence through faith in Christ as 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 his church and um, and yet having just read this to you, I have to say it can be hard to believe that the manifold wisdom of God is being manifested through your life and my life and yet that's the truth and faith says amen to that and the grace of God is teaching us what that means, what it means. To, to say no uh, and and to, to say no to ungodliness and yes to God's will and ways and and that's what it's all about that's what your day-to-day -day is and my day-to-day -day is and and boy there's no better way to live than in the power of God's grace and when we fail and fall and we all do across all kinds of different ways of patterns in our good works we know that Christ has our back and that we're loved for for his sake by our father and that god is is indeed at work so dear church thanks for tuning in and god willing we'll we'll wrap this up next next time we tune in so until that time god bless uh your pattern of of good works in thought word and action in jesus name